Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, thanks for joining us today. I'm Paul Darsh, the uh, Director of Marketing here at John Brooks. Our uh, entire team here hope that you, your family, and your friends are all safe and healthy and uh, remain that way. And that if you or anyone you know are not feeling well, that recovery is speedy and, uh, and certainly complete. Uh, today's talk is on hydraulic considerations when selecting a centrifugal pump. And our presenter is uh, Stefan Bedev. Steph is one of our technical representatives in our pump division here at John Brooks, and he has over 25 years of experience in the fluid handling industry with several pump manufacturers and distributors. A little housekeeping before we begin, uh, your mics will be muted by default for the duration of the presentation. Please use the uh, Q&A icon on the Zoom meeting control bar on your screen to submit any questions you might have. Steph will be presenting for roughly 45 minutes or so, and then he will address any questions that are submitted in the Q&A window at the uh, conclusion of the presentation. We want to respect uh, your time commitment and the one hour schedule. So if there are any questions that are left unanswered after the one hour, uh, Steph will address them in a follow up email to the entire audience. The presentation will be recorded and we will be sending you a link to the presentation uh, following the, uh, the, the seminar. Again, uh, thank you for the attending. And with that, I will turn you over to Steph. Great. Thanks, Paul. Thanks a lot for everyone for attending. Um, I'm confident we're going to get, uh, you're going to get your wor worthwhile out of this situation, out of this, uh, what we're going to be teaching today. Um, just one little note here. Oops, I think, hey, Paul. Yeah, Steph. Um, I'm, I'm not advancing, I don't think, in my uh, video. Okay. Oh, there we go. Okay, it's working okay. now. Sorry, guys. Okay. okay. Bad start. Let's start again. Thanks, Paul. Appreciate it. So uh, we're passionate about what we do. And uh, I think we're going, you're going to get a, your worthwhile out of this uh, situation, out of this uh, presentation. Uh, this video, next video is really for my uh, boss, uh, Martin. I just want to say, Martin, I'm not in my pajamas today. Okay. Uh, I'm sure he's laughing about that right now. I'm just going to assume that anyway. And I hope that everyone out there received their virtual sandwich. I consider this kind of like a virtual lunch and learn. Uh, and then if you did not get your virtual sandwich, uh, send me the virtual bill and we'll take a look at it. But seriously, um, we would love to get out there. We'd love to see you guys and we'd love to uh, talk about uh, what we're passionate about. And that's usually hydraulics, um, uh, pumping systems, filtration, spray, specialized valves. So let's get started. This is the only slide I will read today, and it's who John Brooks is. We were established in 1938. We're a privately held Canadian company, approx approximately 200 employees across Canada, and we're a full service national supplier of pumps, filtration, spray nozzles, custom skid packages, specialized valves, and pressure vessels. Okay, let's get started. What we're gonna talk about today is gonna to be basic pump curves. Then we're gonna move on to uh, basic system curves and this is the building block this is what we're going to build from and from that we better strap your seat belts on because we're going to move on to complex system curves and again we're going to use the basic understanding of a simple system curve to move through this and then finally complex system curves and an analytical approach and I can hear it right now I hope you're not leaving click 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 we'll make it uh, bearable we'll make it fun and the cherry on the top is going to be the results. And the results are what can the uh, what can doing the perfect system curve do for us, or what can it do and reduce our problems in, in the future. So this is going to take approximately half an hour. We'll try and squeeze it into that. And uh, so grab your virtual sandwiches and let's go. So first of all, we're going to talk about pumps in general, uh, but let's talk first about a centrifugal pump. How a centrifugal pump operates is you put water in the centrifugal pump and through centrifugal action, it throws that water outward. And what's left behind in the center is a low pressure zone or a, or a partial vacuum. And that's a good thing. All pumps need a partial vacuum uh, at the suction eye because if we drop the suction line into a fluid source at the bottom uh, below the pump, we're gonna set up a differential in pressure and atmospheric pressure is going to push the fluid 
into the pump. Pumps don't suck. We cannot pull on fluid. Fluid has no tensile strength. So therefore we have to push fluid in. And again, I'll do that again here. Atmospheric pressure pushes on the fluid uh, on the surface of, the, of that uh, lagoon or, or lake. And we've got a low pressure at the eye of the impeller. And therefore we're gonna push the fluid into the pump. What's special about this type of pump would be, we'd have to be able to hand, handle that air before the liquid gets into the pump. And therefore we would need some kind of a priming device or a self priming pump to do that. So then what we do is we put a volute around the uh, impeller and we collect all that fluid that's being thrown off the impeller and we, uh, and we spit it out the uh, discharge nozzle. And here is a standard end suction centrifugal pump, suction side here, discharge over there. And then from the side view suction discharge, Let's remove the guard. And here is the driver, the motor, and here's the coupling. And again, that's a basic idea of a centrifugal end suction pump. So let's now talk about pump performance curves. So let's uh, get a lagoon, get a base, put a pump in place, put a flow meter in place, and then a throttle valve. And what we're gonna do with this throttle valve is we're going to throttle the pump, close it and open it up, and put different back pressures on this uh, pump. And then we're gonna need a suction line to dip into the uh, suction source, into the liquid. And there's our pump. And then we're gonna need some discharge gauges and a suction gauge. And what we're gonna do is, we're first going to fully open this valve, completely open, so there's very few losses or restrictions. Then we're gonna start the pump. There it is starting. And we're gonna assume that it's already primed. So as soon as it starts to spin, we're gonna get flow generated out of the discharge let's say 63 liters per second. It really doesn't matter about the units. That's how much flow we're, ge we're generating in this particular system. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna look at those gauges. The discharge gauge is gonna read, let's say 130 kPa, kilopascals. It could be PSI, it could be all sorts of measurements, but let's use kPa. And the suction gauge reads minus 50 kPa. Because we're on a lift, we're actually having to add energy to lift that liquid up. And that's where that negative value comes from. Now, if there's only one thing you ever take away from this presentation, it's just one thing. And that is the total dynamic head developed by a pump is always going to be the discharge pressure gauge minus the suction pressure gauge. It's, that's what keeps it basic and straight in your mind. So in this case, the amount of uh, total dynamic head or pressure in this, if we're dealing with KPA, is going to be 130 minus minus 50, which is going to be 180 KPA. Essentially, this pump had to bring that negative 50 up to zero and then add 30 KPA to it. So the overall net effect was this pump was adding 130 KPA. Which, will equip, which is equivalent to about 18.4 meters of head. And we'll look at that calculation a little bit later on. So what we're gonna do is we will plot along the bottom of the curve, the flow rate at 63 liters per second. And we're gonna plot, uh, plot that 18.4 meters and we get a point, okay? Then we're going to throttle that valve a little bit more. We're gonna close it down a little bit more. And when we do that, we're going to lose some flow. This pump now is not being able to develop as much flow, but its pressure gauge will increase because now we're fighting against a throttled valve. It's, it's harder to push this liquid through and it's gonna show on the discharge gauge. And if you notice, that suction gauge actually became more positive. It's actually now at minus 45 instead of minus 50. And that's because we're pumping less liquid through the suction side because we're now only at 50 liters per second and therefore the frictional losses have come down. So at 50 gallons and at 50 liters per second, this pump is developing 314 kPa of total dynamic head or let's convert it to head, which works out to be about 32 meters. So we're gonna plot that point again, 50 liters per second at 32 meters. I just want to check right now, you guys all enjoying your uh, virtual sandwich. Just want to make sure we, uh, we, we got the uh, turkey, ham, and gluten-free all in the right places. Okay, now what we're going to do again is throttle that valve even more. And as we do this, we are going to decrease the amount of flow that this pump is developing. 
but increase the total dynamic head. And if we continue to do this, we're going to start to plot a curve. And this curve is going to be a, a reducing the flow all the time as the pressure increases or the head increases. And then we get the final point here. We have closed the valve completely and we've taken this pump to zero flow or deadhead. Now at this point, I might need to throw a warning out there. No pump likes to be deadheaded. Essentially, this pump is spinning, it's running, it's pumping, but no discharge is going past that valve. Some pumps, this will cause damage, a ton of damage, positive displacement pumps and many centrifugals. So at this point, I would say, read the manual. If you ever do this to a pump, please read the manual. Make sure you first of all can do this. Uh, a lot of pump manufacturers do this as a test, but it is okay to do for a short period of time on that particular type of pump. Okay, warning over. Then what we do is we connect these lines up and we have now a pump curve. As you can see, it's a relationship between how flow and head varies with this pump. And if you look at the top right hand side here, you'll see that this is on an impeller diameter of uh, six inch and at an RPM of a thousand RPM. What would happen if we were to change the speed of this pump? Well, let's see. If we were to go through this experiment again, and we were to um, change the speed of this pump to 800 RPM, so we're gonna reduce the speed of this pump, okay? Um, what we're gonna do is we're gonna reduce the performance curve of this pump. So if we do that again, we reduce the speed of the pump, we're gonna reduce the performance curve again. We're gonna get less flow and less head. We're putting less energy into the equipment, into, sorry, into the liquid. Now, if we keep the speed the same, 1,000 RPM, and reduce the impeller diameter from six inch, we'll pull out that six inch impeller diameter, that impeller, and trim it down to five and a half inch, and put it back in the pump, we will see another reduction in performance. And then if we remove that five and a half inch diameter impeller again, trim it down, to let's say five inch, we will see another reduction. And this will go on. And the reason why this happens and the reason why we get this loss of performance or this reduced performance at a change in speed or a change in diameter all has to do with impeller tip velocity. With a radial vein impeller, which this is, uh, most of the performance comes from the speed of the impeller tip, the outer speed of the impeller essentially. So by changing the RPM, we change the performance of the pump. By changing the diameter, we change the speed, the outer speed, even if though we keep the, 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 uh, the speed the same, we change the performance by changing the diameter. So let's go into res system resistance. System resistance, is made up of only two things, static head and friction head. That is it. That is all that is made up of a system resistance curve. So let's first of all look at the easiest one, and that would be the static head. So let's take a pipe and let's fill it full of water, okay? And if we put a gauge at the bottom of that pipe, it would read a pressure, okay? Now, that pressure is going to be proportional to the head, the height of the fluid above that gauge, and the fluid density, how much that fluid weighs, okay? And this all relates to this formula. Pressure in KPA is equal to head in meters times by specific gravity, which is the fluid's density with respect to water, divided by some constant, in this case, because we're dealing with KPA and head, that head in meters, that constant is going to be 0 0.102. Okay, so if we have 10 meters of static head and we're dealing with water, we would expect this pressure gauge reading to be about 98 kPa. Now, remember, static head is measured vertically. So if we take a look at the case here, we have three different pipes. And let's say we fill them all full of the same fluid, water, to a height of 10 meters. Then the static head 
and the pressure gauge reading will be the same. It doesn't matter about the shape of the piping system, okay? Um, the, the head is the head. It's just the vertical height above the pressure gauge. So now let's change some of the fluids. <clears throat> On the left-hand side, we're gonna keep water in that column. So we're gonna see um, a specific gravity of one and that, and that pressure gauge is gonna remain the same. In the middle column, let's, let's fill it full of something lighter than water. Let's say we're gonna fill it full of oil that has a specific gravity of say 0.85. And then on the right side, we're gonna fill it full of salt water or brine. And that has a specific gravity of 1.2. This is 1.2 times heavier than water. And if we take a look at that equation again, we will see that even though the head in these three cases, in these three pipe systems, the static head is the same, the pressure value has changed, not the head. And that was governed by that specific gravity. So when we're pumping fluids, it's really important to know what the specific gravity is. So that was static head. Let's take a look at frictional head. So if we take a look at a pipe and we put a certain amount of flow through that pipe. Obviously the same amount of flow should go through the other end of the pipe. Let's take a look what's going on inside of that pipe. We will see a cross-sectional uh, area, we're going to see a, um, a flow regime, and it could be laminar, it could be turbulent. No matter what it is, we're always going to have some kind of frictional um, value that's going to be opposed the motion of that fluid, and that will manifest itself in back pressure, okay? And these are the two main equations that we use to calculate back pressure or um, uh, head loss due to friction. And they are the Darcy Weisbach formula and the Hazen and Williams. Now, this is just a little bit of a dig for those eight o'clock early morning classes, fluid mechanics. Hey, I just need to just brighten up these guys a little bit. I'm a bit scared of the Williams guy, so I'm not gonna do anything to him. Um, but these are really important uh, um, equations. Uh, first of all, let's talk about the Darcy Weisbach. The importance of the Darcy Weisbach equation is that it can be used on fluids other than the, with the viscosity of water, okay? You'll find out uh, in a second that the uh, Hazen and Williams can only be used on water-like products. Here that Darcy Weisbach, the viscosity within reason really doesn't make any difference. It will be calculatable in this uh, regime. So let's take a look at, uh, let's get a feeling for some viscosity values. At the bottom of the screen, you'll see on the left-hand side, well, you'll see um, a, a liquid with a viscosity of 100 SSU all the way up to a liquid on the right hand side with a quarter of a million SSU. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to drop a ball bearing down and you're going to see and feel kind of what the viscosity values are with these numbers. So let's give it a shot right now. And just remember water at uh, room temperature has a viscosity of about 31 SSU. So here we go. You can see on the right side that's kind of got a value for uh, the, the, on the right side, that viscosity is kind of like cold honey. Let's do that again. Whoops, let's go back, let's do that again. So you can imagine that pumping a fluid with a quarter of a million SSU is gonna give us a whole lot more resistance. It is a resistance to flow. So we're gonna see higher, higher friction losses. So uh, the, the, the viscosity is really crucial. Let's just go through some of these components here. F is dependent on the fluid's viscosity and the pipe roughness. It's just a value that we pick up. Length, L is the length of pipe. D is the inside pipe diameter, not the outside, the inside pipe diameter. And V is the fluid's average velocity moving through the pipe. And obviously G is just the, the acceleration due to gravity. Hazen and Williams really can only be used on water-like products, stormwater, sewage, wastewater, whatever. It has to be water-like products. So therefore the viscosity is already built in that it's gonna be in that 31 SSU range. And we've got a, a, an L here again, total length of the pipe. We've got C, which is a measure of the pipe's roughness. We've got Q, which is the flow rate. And then and D is again, the inside pipe diameter. Very similar, the things that we need, we always need the length, we always need the, the roughness and the diameter of the pipe. So let's consider a piece of pipe. Like I said before, we're always gonna know the length, we're always gonna know the inside pipe diameter. 
the roughness. Well, many times we're not going to go out there and measure the roughness of the pipe. There's tables out there that say there's a roughness value for, let's say, cast iron, which is quite rough, versus high density polyethylene, which is quite smooth. They will all have different tabulated values that we can use. And finally, be careful of the fluid viscosity because it does change with temperature. On the cold side, on, on the uh, left side, we see the uh, viscosity um, of a fluid, the same fluid that's cold and the viscosity of a fluid that's warm. And we're gonna drop that ball through them. And we see that the colder the fluid, the more viscous we're gonna, we're gonna have. So therefore the more um, frictional losses. So be careful with the fluid temperature. It can really make a big difference with viscosity. So now the only variable is flow, and that's a great thing. So let's go back to these two ugly equations because they tend to look ugly, and we're gonna simplify them like that. F, L, D, and 2G are all constants when we know our pipe. Do you agree? We know the length, we know the, the diameter, we know the roughness and the viscosity we're dealing with, and obviously gravity is a known factor. So we're gonna convert that into, and sorry, and Hazen and Williams, all that in the red there are all constants we know once we choose a pipe. So we're gonna take rid of, get rid of all that mess and we're just gonna convert it to what's called an hydraulic resistance or an R value. This is gonna make this so much easier and we can use some pretty easy mathematical analogy here to then do some complex stuff, okay. One thing we do have to do, in the darcy Weisbach equation, it's based off of a velocity. We really don't want to base these things off of velocities. You know, when you're designing a piping system, we're not designing for so many um, meters per second. We're designing for liters per second and cubic meters per hour. We're designing on a volume flow rate. The good thing is, if we know the velocity, we can ch change that into a volume flow rate just knowing the cross-sectional area of the pipe. So. We're gonna convert the darcy Weisbach into a Q squared. And here is the magic formula, <clears throat> excuse me, for the head loss due to friction for either darcy Weisbach or the Hazen and Williams. And it's gonna be head loss due to friction is equal to this R value times by your flow rate to some number N, okay? And this N value is going to be um, two, if we're dealing, or squared, if we're dealing with the darcy Weisbach formula, and it's gonna be in the Hazen and Williams, 1.85. Okay, so let's take a look at using this formula. So we're gonna have a piece of pipe, and we're gonna start pushing flow through that Q, okay? And if we're using the uh, darcy Weisbach formula, we're gonna use Q squared. We're gonna change that N to a two. And we're gonna calculate R times that Q squared, and we're going to get head loss due to friction. And we're going to plot that head loss due to friction as we increase our flow. And that head loss due to friction is going to also increase. And we're going to get what's called a frictional system curve. So it is essentially flow rate and head, and how that flow rate varies sorry, how that head uh, varies with a varying flow rate. Obviously, as we push more and more flow through the system, the head will also increase. Let's take a look at a real example. Let's now take that piece of pipe and strap it to a pump on the discharge side. And let's add a suction pipe to that. And now this again is on another lift situation. What we have to do now is we've got our frictional losses for this discharge pipe. Now we have to include the frictional losses for the suction pipe. So let's do that. We're gonna take, um, we'll know the R, we we'll would have calculated the R for the, for the suction pipe, <clears throat> and we'll know the varying Qs, and we're going to plot a new frictional system curve for the suction pipe. We're gonna connect the dots, and then what we're gonna do is since these uh, pipes are in series, whatever flow flows through the suction pipe is also gonna flow through the discharge pipe. So therefore they are in series. We are gonna add these vertically to get the overall system friction loss uh, chart, okay? 
And now we just have to add a little bit of static head here because we're just dealing with friction. So let's go back. Remember what static head is. Static head is where the liquid is on the suction side to where the liquid is going to end up in a vertical measurement on the discharge side. So in this case, it is this red arrow. So let's put that red arrow across the whole flow rate because that, that static head is not going to change um, unless we start pumping down this, this liquid and the static head is going to increase with time. But let's say it doesn't. We're going to have a consistent head curve, static head curve, which again is in series, essentially. And we're going to add that whole friction system to the static head. And there we have our system curve, total dynamic system curve. And then all we have to do is lay the pump over the system curve and where the system curve and the pump cross is where the pump will operate. Now this is where we have to just put a little bit of a warning in here. Like I said, where the pump curve intersects with the system curve, the pump should operate. Unless on the left-hand side, you're seeing suction, cavitati suction cavitation taking place. And on the right-hand side, you're seeing air entrainment. Both of these phenomenon will cause the pump not to operate where you think it will operate. <clears throat> and these two um, systems, these two um, phenomenon, I've got nothing to do with each other. A lot of people call air entrainment cavitation, and it really isn't. It's got nothing to do with each other, but they will throw your pump curve off. So just be careful about that. So if we want a certain flow right now, all we have to do is come up until we hit the system curve. And then we have to pick, in this case, this pump is running at 1,000 RPM. We have to pick an impeller diameter that's going to cross approximately at this location. So it's somewhere going to, it's going to be somewhere between the six inch impeller diameter and the five and a half inch impeller diameter. So it's probably going to be somewhere in that five and three quarter inch impeller diameter. Now, if we wanted to keep the impeller diameter the same at six inch and lay across a pump curve on the same system with varying uh, impeller speeds, then we we'll pick that point out and we kind of estimate where the impeller speed would be to give us that cross point with the system curve. And in this case, it would appear to be about 950 RPM. That's how straightforward it is. And that's how powerful a system curve is. If we don't have a system curve, we cannot calculate where the pump is going to operate. And therefore we cannot calculate or select the pump correctly. Systems resistance in series. We kind of spoke about this, but we'll do it formally right now. If we have three pipes, and the reason why we have three pipes is maybe one of these pipes is made out of ductile iron. The other one is maybe uh, HDPE, high density uh, polyethylene. And the final pipe is maybe of a different diameter. Each one of these pipes will have a different R value. They're going to have a different L possibly, okay. They're going to have a different diameter and a different smoothness. So we have to treat these ones all separately. And these are in series because whatever flow flows through the left-hand side must come out the right-hand side. So they are in series. What we can do is we can plot each system curve individually. And that's relatively easy to do. We'll know the R and then what we'll do is we'll vary the Q and, uh, and calculate the head and just plot, plot them. Shouldn't take long to do at all. But what's key about uh, pipes in series is the effectiveness of the system curve when we add these is essentially just adding these curves on top of each other. Kind of like what we did with the suction piping and the discharge piping. So let's get a little bit closer and let's take a look <clears throat> at all these three systems plotted on one curve itself, one plot. And what we're going to do is we're going to take the lowest system curve and we're going to add it to the highest system curve. Then we're going to take that middle system curve and we're going to add it again to the top system curve. So we're essentially just adding all three curves on top of each other to get the overall curve. And then we get rid of all the curves and that is the effective system curve for those three pipes in series. Now what we can do is just lay our pump curves over this again, look at 
the location where we want to operate and select our pump accordingly. Pretty easy to do once we have the correct system curve. Let's look at the analytical solution to this. That was the graphical. Let's look at the analytical. Same three pipes, same three system curves, but this time we don't really have to plot the system curves. What we can do, and it can save some time, is we can go back to our friend R again, and we can calculate the R for whichever flow regime we're going to use, whether it's gonna be Darcy Weisbach or Hazen and Williams, and we'll calculate that R, and then we will write them down and just add them numerically together. Now this R value in Hayes and Williams, which I'm most familiar with, is usually quite small. It's usually like 0.002 or 0.0003. We're usually many decimal places. So it's usually small numbers, but it makes a big effect because it's multiplied by Q squared. So we're just gonna add those all together numerically, and then we're gonna take a plot, and this time head loss due to friction is going to equal that R total that we've calculated and we're just gonna start varying the flow rate. And we're gonna to start to get these points. As we vary the flow rate, we're gonna calculate HF. And this system curve will be the same as the resulting system curve curves when we added them all together. So the graphical approach and the analytical approach should give you the same overall system curve, okay? So that's a basic approach, analytical, and graphical in adding pumps in series. <clears throat> Parallel. Now this is where the fun starts. If we have a manifold and we have three pipes connected to it, this system is in parallel. And the reason it is, is on the left-hand side, all these three pipes are connected to essentially the same location. And on the right side, these pipes are all discharging to the same pressure or pressure location. And in this case, it would just happen to be atmosphere. So these are in hydraulic parallel. And <clears throat> just one rule that we, I think we would all agree on, whatever comes in on the left-hand side, the, the must come out the right-hand side. So the three arrows on the right-hand side, those flow rates must equal the left-hand flow rates. What goes in must come out unless there's a leak in the pipe somewhere. So as we know, we can quite easily um, plot the system curve for that individual pipe. We've been doing it for the last 10 minutes. We can plot the system curve for the middle pipe, and we can plot the system curve for the last pipe. And if we can do that, we can now get the effective um, system curve that the pump will feel and pump against. And how do we do that? Well, in the graphical approach, what we do is we put all these three curves side by side, and we're going to add them in the horizontal. What do I mean by that? Well, we're gonna put a plot down below, which is quite wide. And we're going to select a head, just a low, low head to begin with. And we're gonna drop that line across all three curves. Then what we will do is we will register the flow rate where that head crosses each of those individual uh, system curves, Q1, Q2, and Q3. Then we will plot below that same head that we did up top, and we will now add those three cues together and put a point, okay? That's our first point in our combined parallel system curve. <clears throat> Excuse me. Then we will take another head point a little bit higher and we will again um, look at the constituent curves and find out the flow rate at which that higher head now crosses each individual system curve and we will plot that down at the bottom. And therefore now we're getting two points. And finally, we will plot the third um, head point. We're gonna throw it across. Unfortunately, my red scale kind of fell off. So I'm just gonna add a little bit. Sometimes we have to do that. And again, we are going to take a look at those corresponding Q1, Q2, Q3 values. And we will plot them down below against the corresponding head. And finally, we're gonna put in zero, zero, because when there's no flow, there's no friction. And we're gonna combine all those points together. And that will be the effective resistance of all three of those pipes in parallel. This is pretty powerful stuff, because if you try and do this by guess, 
uh, you will probably fail. You, this is a very analytical way of doing uh, systems in parallel. And finally, we will hook up a system and that pump curve or that pump will operate against this pump curve. Now, <clears throat> just for, for ease of, of this question, I have neglected the suction side and that little pipe that connects the two. Let's not worry about that right now, but normally we would add this in series to this system. And then here's the magic. We get a Q total because where that pump curve and the system curve cross, we will get ahead. And then if we go back to those three constituent curves, we will plot that head and the intersection of those three points will be the flow rate through each one of those pipes solved. So it's a pretty slick way of doing things, <clears throat> but it can be a little bit labor intensive because we have to plot. And I don't mind plotting, but if we could do this in a little bit different way, I think if we could do it in an analytical way, it will serve us a lot better. We'll be able to do things a lot quicker and we'll probably be able to do things a lot more complicated. So let's do it the analytical way. And this is where really where you need to strap on your seatbelts here. Analytical way. We will go back to calculating the R depending on whether we're using Darcy Weisbach or Hayes and Williams. We will calculate the R for each one of these pipes. R1, R2, and R3. Easy to do. We've been doing it for 20 minutes now, so it's gonna be easy to do. Then what we're gonna do is, we are going to sub this into this equation, and I know, I can hear the clicking, I can hear the clicking, you're gonna leave me, don't leave me, it's not that hard. If any of you guys are used to um, some of the electrical analysis with resistors, this is Kirchhoff's law. It's just a little bit more involved because Kirchhoff's law does not have the exponents raised. And the reason why we have to have those exponents is because hydraulics isn't linear. The electrical guys and you guys out there, um, V is equal to IR. It's a linear equation. With us, we have V is equal to I to some power, the square term or 1.85 R. So we don't have a linear equation. And so therefore we have to kind of modify Kirchhoff's law. Getting back here, Paul, I hope I didn't lose too many people there. <laughs> anyway, let's take a look. What we do is we put the R value in here. We do, then we go one divided by the R value. And we put the R2 value in here, one divided by that R2, and so on. If we had 10 pipes in parallel, we would do this. And that N value, well, if we were dealing with Darcy Weisbach, that N value would be the square term. So that N would turn into a two, and we would just have the square root here. So this would be to the 0.5. And if we're dealing with Hayes and Williams, that N value would be 1.85 which I believe is something like in the range of 0.54 when you, you divide one, when you take one divided by 1.85. So essentially what we're doing is we will calculate this whole side and then we will just isolate and find out what the RT is. Again, a little bit of algebraic manipulation. If you've got a kid in grade 10 or grade 11, they'll do it for you, no problem. If you want me to just send you a spreadsheet, I can do that too. But this is a real powerful idea because with this R1, R2, R3, we can convert it into the equivalent R value that the pump will feel. So in this case, uh, we didn't have to plot those three, those three system curves. What we would do is we would take the RT value and we would just start subbing in values for the flow and raising them to whether a two, as a, a square term or the 1.85 term, and the HF will be kicked back. And we will just plot that flow value, the Q, with respect to head loss due to friction. And where they cross is where uh, the pump will, will, will operate. And finally, if you wanna know um, what the head loss would be, what the flow rate would be for each individual uh, pump, in the system, all we would do then is take that head loss that, that we got from crossing the system curve and the pump curve together. We would sub it into the left-hand side. We would know R1 value and we just solve for the Q. And that would give us the Q, the flow going through uh, pipe one, the Q going through pipe two, and the Q going through pipe three. And it better equal Q1, Q2, Q3, when all summed together, better equal Q total. 
very very powerful approach and all we've been doing is very simple building blocks of a simple system curve if you can calculate a simple system curve we can calculate the most complex systems so that's the value that we get here and we didn't have to do one plot well maybe just one to find out where the uh, system curve and the pump curve crossed so now we're going to put it all together we're going to actually look at a little pro a little uh, problem here and we're going to see how we're going to use both of these approaches in the analytical way. So we have our pump again on a suction lift, drop the suction line down. And then on the discharge side, we're going to start putting pipes on the discharge side. And <clears throat> if you're just starting out in the hydraulics business, um, that's pretty daunting. How am I going to calculate the system losses through all this through the system in order to choose a pump that will deliver a certain flow it can be quite daunting so what i do is first of all calculate all the r's straightforward to do choose whether you're going to use darcy at weisbach or hazen and williams find out which one's appropriate if you've got some viscosities you might want to go with the darcy weisbach and not the hazen williams then you know the length of the pipes you gotta know the diameter of the pipe and you gotta know the material of the pipe. So therefore that R value should be quite easy to calculate. Then I always start the furthest away from the pump. And that just happens to be these three pipes right here. Now I considered this one pipe because let's say it was all the same material and it was in series. So I just added those R's together quickly. But essentially these three pipes are in parallel. They are all starting at the same location and they're all exiting to the same pressure, which would be atmosphere. So I'm going to replace those three pipes using this formula. Again, it looks ugly. It really isn't too bad. I'm just gonna sub the value for R1 in here, R2 in here, and R3. And whether I use Darcy Weisbach or Hayes and Williams, I'll get the N value, whether two or 1.85. And I'm just gonna solve for RA, okay? I can send you a spreadsheet if you like. So I'm gonna get an RA value. Then what I can do is RA is in series with R4. Well, that's pretty easy. All I'm gonna do is add RA to R4 to get RB. Then RB is in series with R5, good. I'm gonna add R5 to RB, just numerically add them together to get RC. And finally, RC is in parallel, in series with R6. I'm going to add those together to get RD. Looks like now we've got an, a parallel situation here. These RD pipe and R7 are connected by in one, at one side and they're both uh, discharging to atmosphere. So they're in hydraulic parallel. So I'm gonna throw them in this equation again. Notice it's truncated this time. We only have two uh, uh, pipes in, in parallel. So I've got one over RD, which I have the value for, and one over R7, which I've got the value for. And I'm going to chunk away, chug away at this equation and solve for RE. And then once I solve for RE, RE is in series with R8, add them together. And finally, RF is in series with R9 and add them together. And what I'm going to get is RG. And then with that RG, I'm just going to substitute different flow rates and pick up the different friction and plot my total curve, frictional curve. Now I've forgotten something here. I've got to remember to do this. I've got to remember to add the static in here in series. Remember we're on a lift and this pump and this piping could be going uphill. So I better add the vertical static to my frictional losses. And then I'm just gonna throw some pump curves over this and pick the pump that's most appropriate for the value that I'm looking for. So again, just recapping from the basics of being able to um, calculate either graphically or using R values, very basic equations, we can pretty well generate the system curve for any complex system out there. And I would challenge you guys, if you guys are having any issues with some any system curves that you think is extremely complex, hey, I wouldn't mind looking at them, send them to me. I like a good challenge and I'll maybe point you in the way I'd be looking at, at these system curves, okay? So, if we get the system curve wrong, what happens? Well, first of all, you won't get the flow rate that you want. So it's gonna be pretty well in your face straight away. If you want it 50 liters per second and you're only getting 10 liters per second, you know, you've probably got the wrong system curve, possibly. But also, coming from a pump perspective, you could damage the pump. 
Um, here is a generic uh, centrifugal pump curve. And if you see, there is an operating range right in here. And this pump does not like to operate out here on the right side. And it definitely does not like to operate on the left hand side. And this is our no go zone. We get real nervous when we have a pump operating over here. Uh, bad things happen. What happens is if we take a look at an impeller, impeller's running and it's this left hand side is high, high pressure and very low flow. So what we get is we get this internal recirculation taking place. This, um, this impeller cannot empty all this flow into the volute and it tends to recirculate. And when it recirculates, it causes turbulence and turbulence causes low pressure. And this is maybe the next, uh, you know, in a couple of weeks, the next webinar on the mechanics of, uh, of, of cavitation. But this turbulence causes low pressure and it causes the liquid to vaporize. And this vaporization causes a lot of damage. We'll look at some pictures in a second. And that usually occurs at about this zone right here, just to the left of the operating zone. If you really get driven back into that zero flow when we shut off the pump and, and it's pumping against a dead head, we get this recirculation cavitation and we also get discharge cavitation. And this is real nasty. Um, remember, this has got nothing to do with suction cavitation, completely different, um, different uh, mechanism. And it definitely has nothing to do with air entrainment. But this discharge cavitation tends to look like this. This is a pump impeller within its volute. And you can see along the edge of it, about halfway, middle way, and towards the end, we're seeing recirculation cavitation. And then on the tips of the impeller veins, we see discharge cavitation, where all these hammer blows, two to 300,000 PSI of pressure spikes are hitting this. So <clears throat> what's gonna happen? Well, you're gonna ruin your impeller, but probably before you ruin the impeller, you're gonna break a shaft or, or destroy some bearings. Not very good. And that's when you probably call us for warranty and we're gonna then really try and figure out what's going on. And we'll probably do our own system curve to make sure this pump is operating where it should be operating or isn't. So essentially what we have is, if we would have looked ahead of time and we would have done a proper system curve, this system curve says, hey, we're operating okay, but let's say the real system curve is over here. What we would have had to have done is maybe make the system a little less resistive. If you see, this is a very resistive curve. There's a lot of friction going on. Maybe we would have made the pipe a little bit bigger in diameter, or maybe we would have chosen a smaller pump. This is a big pump. Big pumps are not always better in hydraulic systems. They tend to want to pump a lot and they don't like pumping the, the, the smaller flows. So we would probably have to look at a different, different pump in this situation. <clears throat> so that's about it for today. Um, next time, um, we will talk about multiple pumps in complex networks. And again, we're gonna be using the same building block, the same building block of either an R value or being able to plot a very simple system. And from that, we can do some hydraulic, I like to call it magic, but it isn't, it's all science. And we can develop some very um, complicated systems from just basic building blocks. So I hope you enjoyed your lunch. Again, send me the virtual bill. Uh, we love doing lunch and learns. Hopefully when, when, this all, when this all passes, we can get back out there. We're very passionate about what we do. We enjoy what we do. And uh, so give us a call anytime or send us an email. So right now, uh, Paul, I think I'm gonna open it up to questions. So let's have a look here, Q and A. So we've got four questions. Okay. Okay. Why do you still have a negative pressure in the suction at zero? flow. That is a very good point. So if we've got zero flow, we are still holding up that column of fluid because we have not let atmospheric pressure into this system. So I want you to think about if you've got a drink nearby, take the lid off the drink if it's a, if it's a pop or whatever. And I want you to get a straw if you can still get those. And I want you to put the straw into the drink and then put your thumb over the straw and pull the straw out of the drink, but don't pull it completely out. What's gonna happen is that fluid will remain in the straw, okay? Same thing here, when we had that pump totally shut off and no flow value was taking place, we lost all suction 
and friction on the suction side, but we still held up a column of fluid. And therefore, that's the reason why we would see this suction, um, uh, uh, still a vacuum on the suction side. Essentially, that vacuum would correspond to the static suction lift. Hopefully, I answered that. If not, uh, you know, send me a sh give me a shout or, or, or give me a send, send the question again to me. Um, what would be the discharge static head for a multiple parallel piping system? The highest one. So let me think about that. What would be the, di the discharge static head for a multiple parallel piping system? Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to close this down for a second and I'm going to go here. I'm going to uh, end the show. And let's, I think I know what you're talking about here. So uh, let me get my pen out. If I can. Okay. All right, maybe I should have got my pen out first. There we go. So pen. So we have a pump and we have a multiple parallel system. Okay. And let's say our example, these were on the same plane. Let's say in this case, this is at zero, the same elevation as the pi, as the pump, but this is H above the pump. So what we can do is we plot, remember this is our flow Q, and this is our head. We are going to plot first of all, uh, let me see which one we would want to plot first. We would plot this curve at the bottom first. So this curve has no static head, okay? It's this, this, uh, this line right here, this pipe has no static head. It's all friction, so it's going to start at zero. It's going to go up like that. Then this pipe has some static head, okay? And let's say it goes up something like this. What we will do, we will still add these in the horizontal. So right here, we will have, this is our system curve until we get to this point right here. And then at this point, that back pressure is equal to the head in that pipe. So therefore we've been fill up, filling up this pipe slowly as we've been pumping through this bottom pipe until we get to the point where we filled up completely and the frictional resistance in this pipe is equal to the head, static head in the higher pipe. And then at that point, these two system curves add together to make a very flat system curve. And if we have a pump curve that sits here, then it will always operate only on this bottom pipe because it would never have generated enough head to fill this top pipe completely. And if we have a pump that operates way out here, then we will eventually flow through both of these pipes. I hope that answered your question. Now, let's go to the next questions. Okay, we've got quite a few questions here. Um, <clears throat> that was that one, okay, let's go down. The F factor also depends on the velocity of the fluid through, exactly. So someone's saying here, remember on the uh, Darcy Weisbach, we had the F factor. The F factor depends, uh, it, it's a value of the viscosity and the, and the roughness of the pipe. But there's also a major important part of the Darcy Weisbach formula in applying it. And that is whether you are dealing with a laminar flow or a turbulent flow. And that makes that calculating that F value either very, very easy, it's just a very simple formula, or a little bit more complicated and we have to get the Moody uh, diagram involved. So, I'd like to get into that a little bit more, um, but there's no doubt that F factor, I've kind of glossed over it on the Darcy Weisbach, but let's just hope that you don't have to get into the Moody, but if you do, there's, there's ways to deal with that. Oh, how does a self-priming pump work? Okay, self-priming pump works is, um, it has a, a, an amount of fluid in the volute. And as that fluid gets thrown outward, just as before, as the, as the impeller spins, it creates a low pressure in the eye of the impeller. So atmospheric pressure 
pushes down on the fluid in the sump and it starts to push the fluid up the suction pipe. But unfortunately, or fortunately, there is air in front of that um, uh, li liquid slug that's going to enter the pipe and the pump first. So that air goes into the uh, impeller, into the eye, and it mixes with the liquid that is still being thrown internally in this, in this um, pump chamber. Now, if anyone's ever seen a self-priming pump, they're usually big and fat. And the reason for that is because as this liquid is thrown within this um, volute, what happens is there's so much room in there that it exits the discharge of the, of the, of the uh, pump scroll and it re-enters the impeller through what's called a recirculation port. And that continues. So we continue with the same fluid over and over again until we can get the new fluid into the pump. But what happens to this air, slug of air is this slug of air gets pushed into the pump and it mixes with this uh, fluid that's being thrown outward. And it mixes and it all gets thrown out together. Now, fortunately, air is lighter than water. And what happens is the air keeps traveling upward and escapes through an air release valve or whatever else. And the fluid then keeps falling back down and we keep reusing that fluid until we've got rid of all this air in the suction side. And then we've gone dynamic. Again, we've got videos on that. Uh, it would have been nice if I had a graphic there to show you, but that's essentially how it works. And if you go to um, uh, Gromerup, um, grpumps.com, you'll see a whole video on, on how self-priming pump works. works. Or give us a call. Um, another question. Do you consider only one duty point to create the system curve? Let's say the pump is supplying an evaporator that needs pressure between 40 and 100 PSI at a flow rate of 40 and 60 gallons a minute. Very good point. We almost never use just one system curve. Let's not even take your example for a second. Let's take an even simpler example. Let's say we're pumping from a wet well. That wet well will start off at a certain height and therefore the static head will be quite low. We're going to be only lifting maybe 10 feet. But as we pump down that pumping uh, that, that, that uh, system, that well, we are going to increase our static head that we have to pump against because we, our lift is going to keep increasing and increasing and increasing. And therefore, our system curve will be an on-system curve and an off-system off curve. Therefore, the pump will move between both system curves. And in this case here, if we have to design for 40 PSI and 100 PSI, then we better make sure that we have plotted multiple system curves, at least two, and make sure that our pump is happy between those two system points. And we don't go off onto the left-hand side and cause all that discharge and recirculation cavitation. Okay, um, what are the questions do we have here? Assume you have two pipes, pipe A and pipe B, that connect to a common bigger pipe, pipe C, okay? Each pipe associated with their respective pumps of different capacity, pump A and pump B. How do you plot the system curves for that scenario? Excellent question. That actually will be uh, something that we get into uh, in our next system, in our next uh, webinar, which will probably be in about two weeks time. What we have to do is we have to incorporate each pump curve in, its, in, in with the system, the, its own branching system and derate each pump curve. I won't get in, into it today because I don't think we've got the time, but definitely that is part of what we will be speaking about next time. Okay. Um, I don't know, Paul, do we still have time here? Or, or, no, um, I think, uh, I think uh, we're wrapping up there, Steph. Um, okay. About a minute before we're done. And uh, I think that's it. There may be a couple more questions that we can address by email and certainly uh, follow up. Uh, and as you say, there'll be a follow-up meeting and uh, follow-up presentation in a few weeks as well. So, um, Steph, unless you've got anything else to say, I, I think uh, you know, we want to maybe thank our attendees. Yeah. And, yeah. Thank you. Thanks, for, thanks very much. And uh, hopefully uh, this was worthwhile and uh, looking forward to doing it again in a couple of weeks. Appreciate the time. Thank you.